You are listening to a free version of Majority Report with Sam Steeter. To support the show and get another 15 minutes of daily program, go to majority.fm, please. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. It is Tuesday, December 10th, 2019. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, Robert Kuttner, founding co-editor of The American Prospect. On the Green New Deal, the urgent realism of radical change and the the disaster that is the new NAFTA, if you will. Meanwhile, Democrats unveil two articles of impeachment against Donald Trump. And on the same day, because why not? Richard Trumpka, Nancy Pelosi, and corporate Dems announced that they're about to give Trump a and corporations a big win. Also on the program today, Trump attacks the FBI chief who accepts the IG report that the 2016 investigation was appropriate and not politically motivated. Sanders and Warren join the CPC fight versus Pelosi over drug bill in the house and mckinsey pete gives in to making his big name bum uh bundlers public supreme court passes and allows the kentucky abortion trap law to stand 25 percent of americans report they or a family member delayed medical care this past year Bernie Sanders wrote Kahana uh, come out against the $740 billion defense budget, which continues to abet the Yemen atrocities. U.S. blocks a U.N. meeting on North Korean atrocities because we could still make a deal. And the Customs Border Patrol refuses to allow doctors to give flu vaccines to migrant children because all this and more on today's program, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to it. It's uh, another crazy news day. Uh, just a lot of stuff going on at this um, this time of year, apparently. Uh, we still have a big budget fight that's going forward. The defense bill, this um, a USMCA uh, bill, which appears to be uh, happening, the prescription bill, and of course, uh, two articles of impeachment and a plan to vote on it next week. Um, we will get to all that and more. First off, let me just say um, uh, yesterday in the uh, fun half, uh, I was commenting on a video involving Nancy Pelosi, who's becoming a theme around here a little bit. Uh, she was bragging that even though as an Intel committee member, she had known that George Bush was lying. The Bush administration was lying, I guess, about Iraq having nuclear weapons. And she was bragging, essentially, in this CNN or I think it's CNN interview that she wouldn't impeach. Even after that, she wouldn't impeach after they took over Congress. <clears throat> in the course of that, uh, Jane made a comment to which the nature and the timing of I took offense and I uh, reacted. I, I overreacted in a completely and I think inexcusably inexcus- manner. Um, it was unprofessional. But it was also a reaction that was inappropriate in any setting. Um, I apologize yesterday, but it was a sort of a one of those in the moment qualified ones. I was still a little bit heated. And so I want to apologize again, Jamie. Um, I'm sorry. I, I, I screwed the pooch on that one. I will endeavor to do better. Um, it was basically a general dick about it. And I apologize. Um, also want to apologize to the audience. 
because I know that you expect uh, at least marginally better uh, from me. Uh, so uh, with that said, you know, if we want to talk about it more, we can talk more in the fun half if you want. Um, or, you know, after, uh, you know, we get on with the show. But uh, I, I just wanted to let you know I apologize. That's very sweet. And, uh, <clears throat> yeah, I appreciate it. It kind of sucked. Um, and I'm glad that you realized that. And now we can move on. Great. And uh, I'm sorry Matt didn't feel comfortable coming in today. So uh, Brendan's on the board. Um, all right. Uh, so moving on. Yesterday, the Inspector General report came out. This was a report that was obviously initiated in the Department of Justice to determine whether the investigation into and this is a counterintelligence investigation is the way it started. Right. It didn't become a criminal investigation until after uh, James Comey was fired. Whether the uh, counterintelligence investigation into Donald Trump uh, or members of Donald Trump's campaign, we should really say, uh, was initiated for political reasons. Now, the report did find that there were numerous um, failures in the seeking of a FISA warrant, or I guess in the renewal of a FISA warrant. The first FISA warrant on Carter Page, and Carter Page appears to be the only person who was subject of a FISA warrant, started in 2013. So way before this. It was renewed in 2017, I guess, in a fashion that was, um, well, uh, let's see what the report said. Basically, it raised significant questions regarding the FBI chain of commands management in the and having basic and fundamental errors that were made by three handpicked teams on the uh, FBI investigation in terms of seeking these warrants. Look. For years, we have known and been saying that the FISA warrant, uh, the FISA court process is, is a rubber stamp. And so I'm sure there was failures in the FBI. There's a failure in the whole process. That is a different question, certainly an important one. And I would love, again, this is one of those opportunities where, like, let's change the FISA process. Let's use this as an opportunity to strengthen the safeguards against the government spying on Americans. Simultaneously, we also know that the inspector general said this was not a case of a uh, political spying operation at all. It was done legitimately. In fact, the report not only did not find widespread anti-Trump conspiracy inside the FBI. This is from my, Mark Mazzetti's uh, writing in the Times. It even contained damning information about how some agents working on the case hoped that Mr. Trump would win a surprise victory over Mrs. Clinton. Now, I, don't, I haven't read into the reports, like, I guess about 400 pages long. I don't know if those people happen to be in the New York FBI office, but guess what? It wouldn't surprise me. That said, here is a news report on ABC of Christopher Ray, the lead, uh, the excuse me, the director of the FBI, uh, responding to the report. What's the biggest takeaway and the most important takeaway from the report for you? Well, I think there's a number of takeaways that are important. One, that we fully cooperated with the, this independent review. We're Two, really that, that we fully accept its findings and recommendations. Uh, three, that the inspector general did not find political bias or improper motivations impacting the opening of the investigation or the decision to use certain investigative tools during the investigations. Including FISA. Including FISA. But that the inspector general did find uh, a number of instances where employees uh, either failed to follow our policies, neglected to exercise appropriate diligence, or in some other way 
fell short of the standard of conduct and performance that we and that I as director expect of all of our employees. But again, we are and I am ordering 40, over 40 corrective actions to address all of those things uh, in a way that's robust and serious. Uh, and we're determined to learn the lessons from this report and make sure the FBI emerges from this even better and stronger. Okay, now if there was anybody involved in any of this who genuinely cared about the FISA process, whether it, how it's executed by the FBI through all the way that it reaches the court, you would hear people talk about legislation, not leaving it up to the FBI director to make some type of institutional, I don't know, employee handbook changes. But you won't hear that because nobody cares in this process. Nobody cares about that. No, certainly nobody. Donald Trump doesn't care. The Republicans don't care. None of the Democrats are terribly interested in fixing uh, FISA and making it more restrictive. We're still living in a post 9-11 world in that respect. Here's Donald Trump uh, tweeting out. I don't know what report current director of the FBI, Christopher Ray, was reading, but it sure wasn't the one given to me. With that kind of attitude, he will never be able to fix the FBI, which is badly broken, despite having some of the greatest men and women working there. So in other words. He did the part about some of them supporting him did come across. Right. Well, he's upset because uh, the FBI, the uh, director of the FBI wouldn't go along with pretending that somehow this that, that Trump was in the campaign was unfairly targeted. But Trump knows that he still has one more ace in the hole, as it were. Bill Barr's handpicked um, investigator, a U.S. attorney from Connecticut, who for some reason came out and put out a press release in a bizarre fashion saying that he didn't agree with the inspector general report some ways, some vague ways. I guess they're still trying to figure out what their story is going to be and when they're going to release that. Here is Donald Trump uh, talking about how that uh, he's anticipating that report. And that's the one. That's the big one. Despite all the QAnon stuff that we heard that the IG report was going to be the big bombshell. The next one's going to be the big bombshell. And I was just briefed on it. And uh, it's a disgrace what's happened uh, with respect to the things that were done to our country. It should never again happen to another president. It is uh, incredible. Far worse than I would have ever thought possible. Pause it. I want to remind you, he is talking about the report that Christopher Ray on television went out and summarized as having problems with the F, uh, with the FISA application but the origination of all of it and this and that. And incidentally, when he says when this is done to our country, he's talking about he thinks it's been done to him. And it's uh, it's an embarrassment to our country. It's dishonest. It's uh, it's everything that a lot of people thought it would be, except far worse. So I'm going to get some very detailed briefing, but briefings, but they uh, they are. Uh, it's a very sad. It's a very sad day when I see that. Very sad day when a lot of people see that. They had no nothing. It was concocted. And you say what you want. That was a a probably something that's never happened in the history. The history of what? And and don't, don't we have more on that? Isn't he going and talk about? Um... I think he does mention uh, that uh, we've got more stuff coming. Durham is coming out with his report. And that one's going to be, that's going to be the big one. That's going to be the one that he thinks that he's not going to have to pretend says something different than it says. Here it is. To the courts and evidence and they lied to the courts and they did all sorts of things to have it go their way and this was something that uh, we can never allow to happen again the report actually and especially when you look into it and the details of the report are far worse than anything i would have even imagined what they were doing and what they would have done 
if I didn't make a certain move, a certain move that was a very important move, because it would have been even worse if that's possible. And they might have been able to succeed. This was an overthrow of government. This was an attempted overthrow. And a lot of people were in on it. And they got caught. They got caught red-handed. And I look forward to the Durham report, which is coming out in the not-too-distant future. Uh, It's got his own information, which is this information, plus, plus, plus. And it's an incredible thing that happened, and we're lucky we caught him. I think I'm going to put this down as one of our great achievements, because what we found and what we saw, uh, never, ever should this happen again in our country. Yeah, there you have it. Now, of course, if he was serious about any of this, I mean, I know this is ridiculous to even say, he would say, and that's why I have uh, requested that Mitch McConnell get together with Nancy Pelosi and introduce a FISA, a 2019 FISA Reform Act, right? But no, because there was nothing. There was nothing he doesn't care about that. I don't know what his big move was. I fired Comey. That's what I did. Fired Comey. Comey was supposedly scheduled to be on Fox and Friends this morning. Did he? Apparently they, they canceled him when they actually read the report. They thought that uh, the IG report was going to be a little bit better for them. I guess it wasn't. Um, FISA, still a problem. But again... Not um, not the one that Donald Trump wanted. Oh, this is great. Folks, the best part of the holidays, of course, is reconnecting with family, swapping stories, and reliving moments together. But keeping memories alive can be hard. Thankfully, this year, you can give the gift of story worth. We talked about this last year. My folks, I got it for my folks. It happens over the course of an entire year. It's an online service. It helps your loved ones tell the story of their lives through thought-provoking questions about their memories and personal thoughts. I mean, the questions are, you know, pretty straightforward, but, you know, people, you don't really stop and think about these things. Every week, StoryWorth emails your family member different story prompts, questions you never thought to ask, like, uh, what have been some of your life's greatest surprises? What was one of the riskiest things you've ever done? After one year, StoryWorth will compile every answered question and photo you choose to include into a beautiful keepsake book that's shipped for free. You'll never know what family history StoryWorth will uncover. Uh, Now, my folks have been doing this. I don't know. I don't know. I think it's been about a year. I'm pretty close. Um, You can actually see that when they respond to the questions, but I've been waiting to see what the the book is going to look like. And it's uh, tremendous. I mean, particularly, you know, as you get older, you realize, you know, folks aren't going to be around that much. And um, uh, if you want your kids to hear about your parents, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, I'm sure everybody has their different sort of things or friends. Um, It's just a great idea, frankly. And um, you learn stuff about your family that you never knew about. I had a friend who was listening to the show last year, heard this ad, and recently discovered his father, who is an adopted, met his biological grandmother, or met his grandmother, my friend's grandmother, got her this, and was able to create a whole life story out of it. What? Yeah. Pretty cool. That's nuts. It's a great idea. You can preserve and pass on memories with StoryWorth, the most meaningful gift of your for your family. Sign up today. Get 20 bucks off your first purchase by going to StoryWorth.com slash majority. That's StoryWorth.com slash majority for $20 off. StoryWorth.com slash majority. Uh, and folks, oh, would you buy a T-shirt for 50 bucks if you knew it only cost 7 bucks to make? I wouldn't. Never. Everlane. No, we see every day. I know that. (laughs) Everlane only makes premium essentials using the finest materials without traditional markups. Like essentials like, uh, you know, a a collared shirt or a t-shirt or uh, coats, sneaks, 
They're radically transparent about their real costs and every step in their process from materials they use to the ethical factories they work with. You can see what the, what's, what factories, wh- which piece of clothing you're looking at or worked at. And in some instances, you actually choose your price. Not to mention essentials like their cotton crew T-shirt are exactly what they should be. They're versatile. They're simple. They're stylish. They're made from quality materials. Everlane's clothes look better. They cost last, less and they last longer. Uh, if you go to our, uh, if you go to everlane.com slash majority, I think you can see the sneaks that I have. What are they called? They're called the, the trainers. I got the all blacks and I may get the all blues now. I love them. Also hundred percent grade a cashmere. They have cashmere hoodies, quality cotton basics. Like I've told everybody, I don't know why I get to broadcast it, but I've completely, uh, I've completely given over all my underwear to Everlane. All my underwear now. Got it. Everlane. Got it. And you know, well, because of my living situation with the kids, I now color code it. So I know that I have uh, underwear at different places. So my grays are... Yeah, that's too much. Too much information. We got it. Hey, I have, have one of their great cashmere sweaters. It's it's fantastic. And they've got uh, Oxford shirts. They get Italian-made leather shoes. You got to check this out. And right now, you can check out our personalized collection at everlane.com slash majority. Plus, you get free shipping on your first order. That's everlane, E-V-E-R-L-A-N-E dot com slash majority. Everlane.com slash majority. Check it out. And the last thing, this has been great. Uh, Perfect time for this. So, look, you want to get your kids uh, toys. They, like, with Saul, like, he's, like, getting now, like, uh, tablet curious and this and that. I'm going to hold off on a phone, but, you know, we'll let him use the iPad occasionally, plays chess on it and stuff like that. But you also... One of the things that's good for them to, un- to understand, I know that it's you know overblown at times, but it's really good for kids to understand coding and understand what they're playing with. And it's easy to get started with BitsBox. It's a monthly subscription box. It teaches real computer coding to kids ages 6 to 12. So every month they send you a set of app creation projects that they mail it to you. Each box comes with a new theme like animals or robots, which is all kids at that age like. And they follow the instructions on the project cards and they type the app's code on the Bitsox, uh, Bitsbox website. So it you can do this super quick. Saul and I have been doing it. We what happens is a bunch of different apps and they're not, you know, they're not super sophisticated apps. They're like it's like an animated picture of a tiger an animated picture of a giraffe and you can go into the coding and you could switch which version of the, of the tiger you want and which version of the giraffe they have like five or six. I don't know. They already load preload it. Uh, and then the way that they design it is that the, the, the lion roars and the giraffe runs off screaming. And Saul uh, was like, let's change it from roar to fart. And I'm like, I don't know if they'll put that in there. And now the lion farts and the giraffe runs off crying. And it sounds ridiculous, but we did it like a hundred times. He loves it. And then you build it. Disappointed I haven't been invited over. So you build the app and then you can actually download it onto your iPad. So they have apps that they have built. So if they're gonna if they're gonna do that stuff, it's 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 so much better. It feels so much better as a parent to make you think that they're actually learning something. Our listeners get 25 bucks off any Bits Box subscription of $50 or more by going to bitsbox.com slash majority, entering promo code majority at checkout. That's 25 bucks off a free and plus free shipping at bitsbox.com slash majority, promo code majority. It comes in like a like a folder boxy type of thing that you can put up on your shelf. It's BitsBox, B-I-T-S-B-O-X dot com slash majority. Use the promo code majority to order BitsBox today. Your kids will love coding and you'll get them a gift with important skills necessary for their future. And just it just makes them more conscious of what they're doing and what's happening. 
So check it out. All right, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we'll be talking to uh, Robert Kuttner on the Green New Deal, the urgent realism of radical change. We are back, Sam Cedar, on the Majority Report on the phone. It is a pleasure to welcome back to the program the founding co-editor of The American Prospect, Robert Kuttner. Robert, welcome uh, back to the program. Always a pleasure. All right. So, uh, Robert, there's there's two things I want to talk to you about. Um, uh, the big thing, of course, is this uh, new vertical that uh, you guys have at the uh, Prospect. Um, it's at prospect.org slash Green New Deal. And um, you've uh, you're, you, you guys have done another one of these things that I think is a huge service um, knock on wood uh, to a Democratic president in 20 who ends up winning in 2020. Again, knock on wood. Um, but it is a um, you. Well, you explain it. You're looking at, at, at the Green New Deal from really three uh, vantage points. Well, I think our purpose was to rescue this brand and rescue this concept and to demonstrate that it is not only urgent, if we want to save uh, life on Earth, uh, but it's practical, it is fiscally doable, and the challenge is putting together the political coalition. It also does not require ordinary people who have been suffering belt tightening for 40 years, you know, to starve in the dark. I mean, uh, a, a carbon, a post-carbon economy with a great deal of public investment could actually raise living standards. It could return industry, uh, advanced industry to the United States. It could create lots of good jobs. It could finally deliver on environmental justice. So I think what happened was, you know, when, when AOC sat in with her allies in the Speaker's office, that really, can I say pissed off? That really pissed off Nancy Pelosi. So then Nancy went out of her way to trash the whole concept. And the the more radical version of the Green New Deal, the the House resolution, has 95 co-sponsors. And, you know, I quote a famous anecdote from Adelaide Stevenson in 1952 when a, when a gushy supporter rushes up to him and says, you will have the vote of every thinking American. And Stevenson said, uh, alas, madam, that's not enough. I need a majority. Um, we need this thing to get majority support. So... What we try to demonstrate in this in this special issue, which has 22 articles, is that this is good politics, this is good policy, and this is technically doable for about 2% of GDP. Now, World War II cost 43% of GDP. So when you when you do the net-net, what, what's the cost of not doing it? What's the benefit of doing it? You're talking about investing something like 2% of GDP over 10 years, rebuilding infrastructure, getting our entire energy system post-carbon. And it's sensible, it's achievable, it's good politics. So we got, you know, everybody we could get who's really knowledgeable about this to, to fashion a blueprint that is not only aspirational, as they say, but practical. All right, great. And so, and, and you, you set it up as, as squaring uh, three uh, circles. You, you've sort of broadly uh, talked about that, but let's dig into to each one of those um, circles that need to be squared. You start, um, well, for, well you, your first uh, point is, and, and this is, um, <laughs> this is going to be uh, somewhat controversial, I think, to the, um, to the, the uh, lefter most uh, supporters of a Green New Deal, although I think it's, it, you know, embedded in the Green New Deal. I mean, it's there already, but I think that the way that it's perceived in, the, in some measure of, of support is just that it does not necessarily mean, um, like you say, um, sitting in the dark, it does not have to be austere in what it means for our lifestyles. Well, it changes our lifestyles, but, but I mean, if you, you know, if you have decent public transport, so you don't have to sit for three hours in traffic, uh, and if you have all of your electricity uh, renewable, which, by the way, is cheaper over time, and you have decent public amenities and good job opportunities, that's not degrowth. It's a, it's a different kind of good living standards. So I think while I honor and respect the people 
who promote degrowth. If you live in the world, in, in the real world politically, and you look at life from the perspective of 80 or 90 percent of the population who've been experiencing a decline in living standards for 40 years, right. um, degrowth is not a great slogan. Uh, but a different kind of enhanced living standard people could accept. So that's that's squared circle um, number one. And I think um, squared circle number two. Well, wait, let me uh, let me just let's just stay there for one moment sure, in terms please. of that first uh, circle. I mean, you you uh, you cite uh, both um, Nelson Lichtenstein's piece and um, uh, my buddy Kevin Baker's piece. In terms of the 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 way that this uh, the way that the original uh, New Deal um, targeted development and infrastructure that you're talking about here, um, uh, speak to that a bit because I you know uh, obviously um, I want to encourage people to go and read these pieces and I, I'm going to attempt uh, between here and Ring of Fire to have uh, to talk to some of them about the specific pieces, but right. uh, but but more uh but but uh, let's just uh, dig a, just a little bit deeper there in that concept of you know you bring up the idea that um you know we no longer have sort of so-called pork barrel um uh politics in the same way that we did since earmarks have been rolled back uh and and on some level that is problematic and something that we might want to reintroduce in some fashion you know one of the things that the green new deal accomplished was that it was a regional economic development policy. What's happened in the past 20 years is that too much of the development has gone to the Silicon Valleys and the Seattles on the one coast, the New Yorks and the Bostons on the other coast, and the middle of the country hasn't gotten much of this benefit, and that helps explain Trump. One of the great things about uh, a New Deal-style public infrastructure program, uh, Color Green, is that it could it could spread a lot of the wealth around, and that's what the Green New Deal, the, the original New Deal, did. I mean, you had, you know, all the development of the Pacific Northwest that Woody Guthrie sang about. Uh, you had TVA, and these were not just economic recovery programs; these were regional economic development programs, all of the reclamation programs, and so. The whole country benefited. I think in terms of the politics of this, it's pork barrel rediscovered in the best sense of the word. And I think one part of a Green New Deal is massive public infrastructure investment. One part of the Green New Deal is decarbonization. The two overlap. Uh, They're not the identical uh, thing. And I guess the third part is a radical social movement. Um, and there, I think, I'm getting ahead of the story here, but that's the third circle that we have to square. I mean, on the one hand, Sunrise and AOC and all of the activism in the streets, that's necessary to get the attention of more mainstream people. And as, uh, as, as, as Roosevelt famously may or may not have said, make me do it. Right. We got to make them do it. But on this, at, at the same time, this stuff has to get through Congress. And so there are versions of this that are more heavy lifts. There are versions of this that are left ha- less heavy lifts. I think with a with a Democratic majority and a Democratic president, the idea of um, pork barrel in the best sense of the word, that should be very attractive. And I think w- one of the most interesting pieces in this package is by uh, Robert Paswell, who talks about the fact that one of the reasons why um, public infrastructure programs in the United States take forever is the stop and go funding. If you had assured federal funding for 10 years, then you could get on with this. And this is the third circle that we need to square. We need to get some of this done fast so that we have something to show for it, because otherwise you run the risk of getting wiped out in the first midterm which is what happened to Obama in 2010. It's what happened to Clinton in in 1994. It's what did not happen to Franklin Roosevelt in 1934, because in his first two years, he had something to show for it. Okay, so let's um, let's just back up here a little bit. When we talk about this uh, pork barrel, that is um, that is it's it's a twofold. um, I guess there's it's it's a twofer, as we would say on uh, in radio um, that you, one, obviously, 
earmark certain projects and you will bring on board people who aren't necessarily, um, you know, their their bona fides with their constituents is not being a uh, a green warrior. But if they can provide um, uh, infrastructure or, uh, you know, material benefit in the form of like, here's. I don't know, $50 million to uh, to redo your transit system in your district or whatever it is. I'm just, you know, uh, throwing numbers around. That's that's one way of bringing people on board um, in terms of passing the legislation. It also has the added benefit of your reaching into and, and and when we say the middle of the country, we're really talking about. Rural areas that are uh, there's more of obviously less density uh, once we get uh, outside of the sort of the the, the east and west corridors, um, and so this um, explain that dynamic about the funding. I mean, it, I, I think it. I mean, it makes sense. I think for people who work in any type of sort of organization that um, has gone through sporadic funding but for those who haven't just lay that out just a little bit more for us you know if you think about public works projects in the united states they typically lowball the cost because they haven't got the money lined up in advance then a year goes by and they say whoops we run out of money we have to suspend this for a year then they have to scramble for the money um two two examples um the Second Avenue subway extension in New York City, you know, has taken 30 years. Uh, and each year of delay adds to the cost and undermines the public's trust that government is capable of doing anything competently. Now, Andrew Cuomo, the current governor, who is not one of my favorites, decided to rebuild the old Tappan Zee Bridge and name it after his father. And God bless him, he lined up the funding. He had all the funding in advance, so it wasn't stop and go. And the thing came in ahead of schedule and under budget. And the two things are related because it's delay that adds to cost. Um, and another really great example in the Paswell piece is the, and it's a paradoxical example, you know, the one massive public works program in the United States that has guaranteed advance funding and advance planning, God help us, is the interstate highway system. And so that gets done very efficiently. Now, it's the wrong kind of public works. Right. If you had that kind of advanced funding and advanced planning for high-speed rail or local commuter rail, uh, you could get it done much more efficiently, much more cost-effectively. Uh, so with a Green New Deal where you had, pick a number, half a trillion dollars a year for 10 years, with a guaranteed source of funding, then state and local government could plan. And if you can plan projects, that's that's a good thing in and of itself. And uh, it's more cost effective. You can get it done more quickly. That's the basic concept. OK. And uh, uh, then, you know, sort of we're 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 circling back a little bit, but go to that second circle, which is um, the idea here is this needs to be. A, a day one, as it were, not to cite another project on uh, the, the prospect, um, but this needs to be a day one um, uh, project because um, the, the, the payoffs, there needs to be material benefits delivered uh, in time for that midterm uh, election to, uh, to, to go forward. Is that basically it? I mean, and then we can maybe also talk about the incremental nature uh, and, and necessity of, uh, of what you cite, um, the non-reform reform, I guess, or non-reformist reform in, in quoting uh, Andre Gores. But let's, uh, I mean, just talk about the, the, that need for immediacy. Well, I think, um, you know, rather than squander whatever uh, power, whatever goodwill the new president has, if we're making a heroic assumption that progressive Democrat gets elected and, and takes the House and the Senate with them. But let's make this assumption, because obviously, if we don't do that, we, we might as well all just give it up if we lose the election. Um, but let, let's assume this happens. Then the first order of business is, is, is it's sort of like what, what Obama did with a much weaker recovery program. Get some serious money, get it appropriated, get it through Congress and get some of it out there. And there are some things you can do that are relatively quick. Uh, like uh, subsidize uh, people's ability 
um, to um, uh, transform um, where they live into uh, energy efficient um, housing. And you can do that through tax credits. You can do that through direct subsidies. You can have direct subsidies for purchase of electric vehicles. Uh, you can start getting some public works programs going. I mean, there are lots of public works programs that are on the shelf that have been pre-approved that are not going forward for lack of funding. So you can green light those from the get-go while you're planning phase two so that there is some stuff to show uh, much bigger scale than the, than the, the Obama recovery program. And that's the kind of stuff you can do. You can do day one that, that actually has some, some highly visible payoffs. And we, we should and just then, remind people in terms of like, you know, comparing it to the Obama stimulus, because we heard a lot about it, stuff like where they can't find shovel ready, ready projects. There was only half of that seven hundred and fifty billion dollars, as it were, uh, was just simply uh, tax cuts, essentially. The That's other, right. The other half was ostensibly for um, for projects, but because the funding wasn't uh, wasn't sort of overwhelming. I mean, there was no sort of like shock and awe quality to that funding. There was a lot of stuff right. that didn't happen because people were trying to find essentially matching grants to it. Exactly. And the other thing that could be done right now, by the way, you could have pre-approval of projects on the assumption that in January or February 2021, the funding will materialize so that the permitting and the planning um, will have been done in advance. And then you have shovel-ready projects. You don't have to wait for an election of a new president. You, you've got you know 20 or so states that have uh, relatively progressive state governments. Those states could could pre-approve projects, and then you know, uh, once once a new president gets uh, elected, the money could flow to those projects. Okay, and so the third circle that uh, that has to be squared again is uh, is that what you write is the connection between radical witness and agitation and the need for policies that can be embraced by the next president and enacted by Congress. Um, and it's uh, you 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 raise this 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 notion. I mean, it was interesting in terms of the history of the I guess the what people refer to as the Green New Deal metaphor that this was out there. I mean, the, I mean, the story of that uh, of that, I guess that just the. The metaphor is a, I think, a prime example of what you're you're arguing. Um, this metaphor existed in the context of of uh, of papers and and you know policy papers that were written, but it it took uh, AOC and uh, the Sunrise Movement to make it a, to the extent that it is a household um, a name, but. Um, you're talking basically about there has to be this dance that everybody is sort of like um, is participating in on some level. I think there's always an alliance between radicals and liberals. You know, if you look at the civil rights movement where there's civil disobedience on the ground, <clears throat> but Lyndon Johnson eventually welcomes it because it took that kind of radical agitation for him to uh, build up ahead of steam and finally get the Voting Rights Act through Congress. Same thing in the 1930s, where you have really quite radical agitation on the part of the CIO unions, and then Roosevelt um, delivers first the Wagner Act and then other pieces of legislation, and then the partnership with organized labor during the war. And uh, <laughs> radicals make liberals uncomfortable. My, for, for years, I had a cartoon pinned up on my wall which is circa 1967. It's a Jules Pfeiffer cartoon, and it's this nervous liberal carrying a placard uh, protesting the war, and the placard says, a little less bombing, you know, because because the radicals were either chanting, uh, ho, 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 ching, ming, the NLF is going to win, or they're saying, stop the bombing, and this liberal is saying, a little less bombing. So the radicals push the liberals, and the liberals are uncomfortable but they need to be pushed. And I think that's the story with the Green New Deal, that this, this agitation may be for a more uh, transformative, more expensive version of this than the liberals really want. But ultimately, it's the liberals who have to get the thing through Congress because we don't have a radical majority in both the House and the Senate. 
And so this is never entirely comfortable, but radicals have a piece of this action and liberals have a piece of this action and they got to learn to work together. All right. Uh, uh, so f- I, I can't encourage people enough to go over to uh, the prospect and check this out. Um, there are, uh, I, I mean, over a dozen it, uh, um, uh, 20, piece, is it 20? 20, 20, 22 articles, uh, Jeff Sachs and Bob Poland on how to pay for this and what it's going to cost. Mariana Mazzucato on how to get planning back in good odor. Uh, Jeff Foe on how to redeem faith in the public sector. Three environmental justice pieces and then closer with Bill McKibben. So it's an all-star cast. It's a great read and it's a blueprint for how to do this. Jay Inslee is in there. He's uh, talking about governor's roles. I mean, uh, so folks can check that out. But in the meantime, since I have you on the phone, because I know this is also sort of in your wheelhouse, um, it is being reported. And I'm not quite sure where we are in the reporting at this point, but that um, uh, Nancy Pelosi uh, believes that she has a deal now for the USMCA. This is sort of the updated NAFTA. and supposedly Richard Trumpka is on board. Um, give me- well, the AFL just the, the AFL CIO just put out a press release signed by Trumpka confirming that. Okay, I did not know that. And okay, so give me your uh, reaction to this uh, because um, my my hot take this is um, a disaster. Frankly, uh, on some level, maybe not so much in terms of the deal, but in terms of um, the uh, the political implications for this. Yeah, I think it's a travesty. I think it's an absolute disaster. And I think um, in fairness to Trump, I think the labor movement was split. You had some unions who thought this was a good deal. The machinists just came out against it. So he was he was facing the split in the labor movement. Uh, he was facing a lot of pressure from Pelosi uh, to to get this done. But I just what what just bewilders me is the following: here you have an impeachment resolution about to be voted, and why Nancy Pelosi would pick this moment to make Donald Trump look good is beyond me. I mean, I think I understand the politics. I think some of the so-called frontline Democrats, the Democrats who won House seats in districts that voted for Trump kind of like the idea of associating themselves with a policy that is one part Trump and one part something that left wing Democrats uh, and other Democrats have been pushing on. But I think uh, Trump succeeded in co-opting them. You can just imagine this smug bastard standing up there with the AFL eating out of his hand. And this is going to really damage the Democrats next year because Trump is going to be able to say, hey, look, man, even the AFL-CIO supported me. I delivered for working people. And um, that should have trumped, no pun intended, the, the, the fact that the USMCA, so-called, is a little bit better than the original NAFTA because it's only a little bit better. So, uh, I, God, it's a head-scratcher. You, you wonder, I mean, I think there was too much inside baseball, too much... Um, political calculation about how this would help a handful of House Democrats. And then, of course, you had guys like Richie Neal, the head of the Ways and Means Committee, and other corporate Democrats really pushing for this because American business wanted this. Right. So it's it's everything that, that makes you exasperated about the Democratic Party. I mean, the the I mean, first off, the. Uh, I, I already can tell folks what the Facebook ads, whatever the ads are going to be, yeah. in Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania, it's going to be a picture of Donald Trump with Richard Trumpka. Absolutely. And, and, and this guy's about to be impeached. So why you would do anything to associate progressive Democrats with Donald Trump at this moment in history is, is beyond me. I would also add that we have a, a clip of uh, Wilbur Ross that we're going to play a little later going on Fox News saying that the only reason why the Democrats are doing this is to distract from the uh, inspector general report. I mean, the, their ability to leverage these things so far yeah. outpaces. Um, and and I, I don't know. I, I, this is I just I, it's it's stunning to me. It's such bad, uh, stupid politics. And there is no, uh, as far as I can tell, you know, sort of significant material benefit to anybody 
Um, it's not like they held out for something that was absolutely crazy. My understanding is that uh, Pelosi's attempts to strip uh, the the sort of 230 provision uh, or, you know, the uh, the provision that gives uh, 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 liability protection to uh, tech companies that failed. So that's still in there, which is going to impact U.S. law going forward. Um, this thing seems like a massive disaster. At what point do people start to say that Nancy Pelosi doesn't know what she's doing? Well, that's a good question. I mean, I by, by coincidence, I was at a, a dinner with a bunch of uh, Democratic progressive Congress people. This is about a month ago. And at that point, the progressives in Congress were, were putting all their chips on Rich Trump and hanging tough. And 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 the de- the Democrats' line was, well, if if Trump is against it, we're against it. If Trump is for it, we can vote for it. And so they were betting the farm that Trump would hang tough. But uh, and, and I, I get the jam that he's in. Some of his unions want it. Some of his unions don't want it. What I don't get is Pelosi deciding that this was the moment to give Trump bragging rights for anything. I mean, if they just delayed for a year. Get a Democrat elected president and and then renegotiate NAFTA properly. That would have made so much more sense. Unbelievable. Um, It really does seem to be about um, uh, 10 so-called frontline uh, Democrats who, um, you know, as far as I can tell, that um, the the campaign manager, Donald Trump, put out a... uh, uh, the other day, some uh, internal polling that they had about, uh, I can't remember who it was, a congresswoman from Oklahoma, uh, bragging that uh, that impeachment was hurting her. And uh, the, the polling showed that the impeachment was actually doing better than she was in yeah. that district. You I know, mean, it, th- it, 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 it's even it's even worse than the so-called frontline Democrats. It's the corporate Democrats using the frontline Democrats, the, the, the people who were pulling the strings on this were, were the corporate Democrats who wanted to vote with the Republicans. And then so the poster children for this were the, hey, we got to, you know, it, it's not as if voters in Oklahoma City or voters in, uh, in, 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 uh, in, in Western Illinois or voters in any of the other congressional districts that were taken by Democrats that had gone for Trump were sort of following all the nuances of one of the most convoluted pieces of trade legislation in the history of the world. Uh, this is about headlines and bragging rights. And if this had gone down, it's not like this is at the top of the list of things that ordinary working people care about. Yeah, it's stunning. It's a stunning failure of politics that I think uh, the Democratic leadership just he keeps um, sort of showing us new um, uh, a, a new achievements in failures, it seems to me, at least uh, political sensibilities. Um, you know, and I, I've been a Nancy Pelosi fan. I've been a Nancy Pelosi defender. But I, there's no way I can defend this. And I'm sort of, as someone who really admires Trump, I'm just really saddened that Trump did this. And there's no, I mean, this is a, this is a done deal at this point now. Yeah, they, the, well, the, the last thing preventing it from being a done deal was Trump explicitly endorsing it, which he did in a press release a half hour ago. Right. All right. Well, uh Robert Kuttner, uh, founding co-editor of The American Prospect. Uh, folks can head over to uh, prospect.org to uh, check out the Green New Deal vertical. Uh, there's uh, 20-some-odd uh, pieces there that cover uh, really every aspect of actually getting this uh, done. Uh, Robert, thanks so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thanks, so much. Thanks for having me, Sam. So there you have it. <clears throat> um, the... The dynamic of the frontline Democrats being a fig leaf for uh, the corporate wish list, uh, it's just um, sad when the people who are supposed to box them in on the and the union leadership are not doing that. And um, uh, it'll be interesting to see if there's any blowback from that within the, the context of the AFL-CIO. So... Uh, I guess we'll see. But the prospect of, again, of, you know, Donald Trump's ads with pictures of him and Trumpka in places like Wisconsin and Michigan, Pennsylvania. And, you know, uh, union density across the country is low. 
It's at an all-time low, I think, in this country, or at least in the past over 100 years. Um, however, in those states, the number of of homes, my understanding, the percentage of homes where there's a union member in them uh, voting is somewhere around 20, 25 percent. So the implications of Donald Trump being able to use a deal with the unions, presumably, is um, politically relevant in these areas where you're talking about, you know, 20,000 in Michigan to 12,000 in Wisconsin, 44,000 in, in Pennsylvania, somewhere around that in terms of those numbers. So a, a huge mistake by Nancy Pelosi, but she thinks it will, uh, I guess, keep the money flowing from these uh, from corporate benefactors into the Congress. And I imagine <clears throat> on some level when Pelosi sees AOC raise one point five million dollars in the last quarter without those corporate donations, they panic and they're like, we're going to need those corporate donations to push back on this. So this is a big part of uh, the battle that's going on right now. Just by, for comparison, in 2012, Obama, across all labor member unions, had a plus 35% margin, whereas Clinton had a plus 16% margin. And amongst men, white men, uh, Obama had a plus 10, and Clinton had a minus 12. So that's a jump of 21 points. Right. And it's tough to know what to specifically to attribute that to, um, particularly in 2012. By that point, uh, you know, Obama's promise of putting on his soft shoes and walking with union members in uh, Wisconsin, I think it was quite clear that he was, he was, didn't have any soft shoes. Turns out. But uh, nevertheless, you're going to need to fight for those union members. You're going to need somebody who has a completely unequivocal uh, history of supporting union members. I think uh, think you have a good idea who that might be. Yeah, yeah, Pete Buttigieg. Pete Buttigieg, of course. McKinsey Pete. Uh, Folks, let me just remind you before we go that uh, Bitsbox, it's a monthly subscription box, if you will, sort of like folder. It teaches a real computer hardcover folder. It's nice. You put it up on the the, uh, bookshelf. It's a hardcover folder. It teaches computer coding to kids ages 6 to 12. But this is a fun thing. I don't want to make it sound like you're giving them a course. It's not. It's fun. They love it. At least Saul does. It's fun to be able to do stuff with your kid and feel at the same time like, A, they're engaged, and B, they're actually learning a skill that may have some relevance for their future. At the very least, just they understand what they're doing when they look at a computer screen instead of just sitting there and, you know, I don't know, Playing a video game, they can almost like create one. You can get $25 off any Bits Box subscription of $50 or more by going to bitsbox.com slash majority, entering the promo code majority at checkout. That's $25 off plus free shipping at bitsbox.com slash majority, promo code majority, bitsbox, B-I-T-S, B-O-X dot com slash majority. Use the promo code majority to order Bits Box today. Your kids are going to love the coding or your grandkids or your friend's kids. Makes for a great gift um, this holiday season. Check it out. All right. And just a reminder, your support makes this show possible. You can become a member at jointhemajorityreport.com. Jointhemajorityreport.com. When you become a member, not only do you get the free show free of commercials, but you also get um, extra content every day. And the the warm feeling that you are supporting a uh, show that you like to listen to and you find helpful on your daily basis or a twice daily basis, twice weekly basis or once weekly or three times, whatever, however you ingest the show, however you consume it. Also, uh, check out just coffee.coop, fair trade coffee, tea or chocolate. Use the coupon code majority get 10 percent off. But I think it's still 30 percent. I think we're still in the 30 percent zone. You can go and try out a bunch of different the coffees over there at just coffee.coop. Also, AM Quickie, it's live. 
You can sign up for it at amquickie.com. Today is Tuesday. Um, wait, uh, you got the show tonight? Yeah. Okay. What's going on? <laughs> Did you not know that? I'm just uh, disoriented. Uh, TMBS tonight, 7 o'clock. We're talking pretty in-depth on the Corbinite Project, UK elections. What happens? What are the three different scenarios that we could see tonight? It's global implications and more. And then uh, Camille from Telesaur is going to join us. We're talking about elections in Dominica, the ongoing fallout of the coup in Bolivia, right-wing forces and capital, and how to talk about climate change in a way that doesn't empower both, and a ton more. The Afghanistan papers, this new defense bill, Yashka Fisher, and the European perspective on populism. Patreon.com slash TMBS. Michael Brooks Show on YouTube. Snag your tickets to see us February 7th at the Bell House. Jamie. This week on the Antifada, Sean sits down with fellow socialist rail fan Justin Rosniak, a.k.a. Do Not Eat, to get at the real and sordid history behind the 1988 blockbuster Who Framed Roger Rabbit. Did you guys know that this movie was about trains? I don't recall that part, but I was really little when I saw it. Um, so, yeah, they talk all about the movie and the role of the rail system in the Green New Deal and a potential socialist horizon. Also out tomorrow is our episode with Alex Vitale, the author of The End of Policing, which is out now on Verso Books. And he's done so much really important work in this area he has so much data to back up everything that he's saying and i'm really excited to get that out there patreon.com slash the antifada and uh matt is not with us today but you can check out uh, literary hangover at uh, patreon.com slash literary hangover arthur miller the crucible boom all right folks quick break see you in the fun half Left is best. Jamie and I may have a disagreement. Yeah, you can't just say whatever you want about people just because you're rich. I have an absolute right.